Okay, family. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening to you. Welcome, welcome to the mental house with me, your host, Khadija. All right. This video is going to be a little long. In fact, it might be two parts because I think it's real important um, that we take a look at what is going on, okay? Because it's real serious, extremely serious, okay? And um, it, 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 it kindles up something inside of me when I seen inside the highway holdup that netted thieves $100 million in rare jewels and it has left the LAPD scratching his head. Crooks waited at a truck stop for the Brinks van drivers to pull up at 2 a.m. before emptying it 27 times. Y'all hear this? Now, a lot of y'all might just think, ah, 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 they just got a nice hoax. Oh, they got a nice pool, nice hall. But a lot of y'all understand that when, I'm going to say white men because I'm, I'm pretty sure that's what it is, are so brazen and bold to do something like this, it's usually because they're supporting um, a white supremacist group. They're supporting their uh, agenda. Um, we all want to know where some of this money is coming from to fund the madness. Don't look any further. No, baby. Don't look no further. Okay? So, the story says... Police believe a team of burglars discreetly truck, tracked a truck carrying $100 million worth of jewels from a gym show in Northern California to a, a Los Angeles truck stop before raiding a vehicle in one of the largest jewelry heists ever. The thieves robbed the Armor Brinks truck around 2 a.m. on July 11th at a Flying J truck stop along Interstate 5 near um, Grapevine, an unincorporated community in the St. Uh, Joaquin Valley in just 27 minutes. The burglars, now check this out now, the burglars managed to bypass the truck's loading mechanism undetected and then loaded the gems into storage containers before hauling them away. Okay, I wonder how long they planned this. Because they always get a jump on stuff while we sit, while we sleep. Investigators believe several thieves had to be involved. Duh! Uh, duh! Which left 18 victims suffering a loss of multi-millions. The merchandise had been loaded into the truck the night before following an exhibit hosted by the International Gym and Jewelry Show in San Mateo, south of San Francisco. It was heading to Pasadena, to the Pasadena Convention Center. Police are still probing how the thieves got into the truck and whether or not they knew about the valuable contents ahead of the theft. I think they did. Uh, law enforcement sources told the Los Angeles Times that two armed guards left the big rig at a truck stop in the early morning of July 11. The group of thieves then quickly broke into the truck, entered its tractor trailer, and started unloading containers holding jewelry, gold, diamonds, rubies, emeralds, and lots of other luxury designer watches, including Rolexes. <laughs> now, there's a story that, that uh, well, let me finish this. And I'm going to tell you why I said what I said about the white supremacists using this as a means to fund their madness. Okay. <laughs> um, because this is not the first time they've done this. It's, we never hear nothing more about it. 
after it's done. Okay. Um, he noted from the outside that it wouldn't have appeared the truck was carrying any riches, but guards openly carrying fire, firearms while driving the vehicle could have tipped off a watcher by. FBI agents and major crime investigators at the sheriff's office have searched the, the Flying J for clues, interviewed potential witnesses, and reviewed security footage from the truck stop. Uh, McKinsey failed, declined to reveal further information about the case, saying, well, obviously we aren't about to say what we have at this stage. I mean, just top-notch rubies, emerald, oh, you name it, beautiful jewels. The initial estimates indicated $100 million worth of jewelry was taken. That's $100 million, y'all, despite the truck only was insured for less than $10 million. We are talking multi-million dollars here. It's a huge amount of money, McKinsey stated. International Gym and Jury Show President Arnold Duke revealed the truck was transporting many 70 to 100 pound storage containers housing gyms and jury. Previous reports indicated that these took between 25 and 30 bags containing unknown um, numbers and an num unknown number of individual pieces. We are looking at more than $100 million in documented losses, Duke said. This was absolutely a huge crime. One of the largest jury heists ever. He added that there were 15 exhibitors, each with $5 million to $10 million in merchandise. These are small businesses with their entire wealth invested in that truck. It has destroyed them financially and it affected their health in some cases. You think? Although the loss was massive, Duke noted that the thieves did not manage to take all the value from the truck. Sandy Swanson must be kin to uh, Tucker Carlson. The exhibitor's director explained shortly after the theft that even though the jurors are quite expensive, most of the vendors who travel between jury shows typically underinsure their merchandise because they can't afford to insure it fully. That's where the discrepancy comes in. These are mom and pop operators, she said. They are devastated. Some of these people have lost their whole entire livelihood. Duke wouldn't discuss security measures at the show, but did note that all the people were photographed as they entered the facility. He also claimed that the merchandise is typically transported in a semi with a bulletproof cab, equipped with tracking and elaborate camera systems. The vehicle also is driven by armed guards at its exact route. Um, where it, uh, the vehicle is also driven by armed guards and its exact route is kept secret. Really? Maybe they like our secret service man that erased the text messages. Officials who have stated that the thieves likely tracked the truck from San Mateo are probing everyone with knowledge of this route. Flying J's parent company has requested surveillance video from the travel center which is open 24-7 in an attempt to help law enforcement with their investigation. Briggs issued a statement shortly after the thefts uh, stating, We are working with law enforcement and we will fully reimburse our customers for the value of their assets that were stolen in accordance with the terms of our contract. Additionally, insurance underwriters claim truck stop cargo thefts are relatively common. Cargo theft is a massive criminal enterprise in the Los Angeles area, and last year alone, they saw more than $57 million in cargo truck thefts. California is also top state for cargo snatches. 
Now, I'm just going to keep it real. Uh, this was some of the uh, black and brown games if you're going to practice something as opposed to running around shooting up your neighborhood. Why don't you be like Robin Hood? I mean, if you want to do dirt, do it right. Do it right. Now, I don't by any means advocate for this kind of behavior. But if you're going to do it, do it right. And that's why I said for the black young men. Because basically, in Uriah, California, this same thing happened. As a matter of fact, let me pull up Rachel mad out and let her explain exactly what I'm talking about. North from San Francisco, you cross the Golden Gate Bridge. Uh, you will soon find yourself on Highway 101 headed into uh, the northern part of Northern California. And if you keep going straight up that highway, about 120 miles up Highway 101 from San Francisco, you get to a place called Ukiah. And 33 years ago, in July 1984, on Highway 101, just outside Ukiah, California, uh, there was an armored truck that was traveling up that highway in broad daylight, and the truck got ambushed. It was a portion of Highway 101 that was on an uphill climb. Uh, the armored car was fully loaded, had to slow down as it was chugging up that incline, and that's when the robbers struck. There were other drivers who saw it happen. This is in broad daylight. And they described a pretty uh, professional operation. Two pickup trucks were involved. Once the armored car started to slow down on that uphill climb, one of the pickup trucks pulled in right behind it. And then another pickup truck pulled in right in front of it. So one right behind, one right in front. They're boxing in that armored car as it was laboring up that incline. And then in what appeared to be a well-coordinated action, guys with guns leaned out of the two pickup trucks, one in front of, one behind of the armored car, and they shot out the tires of the armored car. And that forced the armored car to a stop. There were reportedly six gunmen all together. All of them had their faces covered up with bandanas or ski masks. There's three guys in each of these two pickups. Uh, after they brought the armored car to a halt, they then used high-powered guns, maybe rifles of some kind, to shoot out the reinforced glass on the armored vehicle. And that's how they got inside it. They got the doors open, and they took off with 10 to 15 heavy bags full of loot. It was all witnessed by other people Sound on the highway. Broad daylight. They drove away up 101 in these two pickup trucks. They dumped them somewhere nearby, and then they got into a different vehicle, and they sped off. It was fast. It was professional. It was a very heavily armed operation. And it turns out they got a huge haul from that one armored car heist. $3.6 million in cash from that one armored car. And some of the money disappeared, was never accounted for again. But when the government filed its indictment the following year against the gang that had pulled off that heist on Highway 101 in Northern California, the government in its filing said that they had been able to trace some of the cash that was stolen from that armored car in Ukiah. And the list of where that money went changed everything. $300,000 went to a particularly virulent and violent chapter of the Ku Klux Klan in North Carolina. Another aggressively organizing Klan leader in California got $250,000. The National Alliance, a Nazi group based in Washington, D.C., they got $50,000. The Aryan Nations up in northern Idaho, they got $40,000. That one heist, that Ukiah armored car heist, it wasn't just a huge multi-million dollar robbery. It was also supposed to fund the start of the next civil war in the United States of America. The guys who robbed that armored car on Highway 101 back in 1984, they were part of a neo-Nazi gang that called itself the Order. And the Order is best remembered now for having assassinated this man, a Jewish talk radio host in Denver in 1984, a man named Alan Berg. But most of the crimes committed by the Order weren't just straight murder and assassination, which we remember them for now, 
most of their crimes were about money. When they robbed armored cars and they robbed video stores and they robbed banks, all of, all of these robberies that they committed, all up and down the West Coast, they were all designed to collect cash to arm and fund a violent movement that was going to wage a race war in America. A race war that would ultimately create a whites-only homeland in the United States. Uh, and, and these guys in this gang, the Order, they weren't the only people who had that idea at the time. A year after the Order was indicted and that whole gang went on trial, uh, it was a married couple in Wyoming. A married couple stormed this elementary school in Cookville, Wyoming. And the couple took hostages. Uh, they had guns and bombs. They took 150 kids and teachers hostage at that elementary school. They held them all hostage for two and a half hours. They had a ransom demand. In exchange for the lives of all of those kids and teachers, the couple demanded a multi-million dollar ransom that they, they said they would use to finance a white supremacist revolution for a new white separatist homeland in America. Uh, in addition to their guns, that, that couple who took all those kids and teachers hostage, they, they, they brought in bombs, as I said, but they were homemade gasoline bombs. Ultimately, a bunch of the kids who they took hostage ended up getting burned. But the only people who died that day were the two hostage takers. Throughout the 1980s into the 1990s, there were regular national white supremacist meetings. They called them the annual Aryan Nations Congresses uh, up in northern Idaho. They held a big piece of land up there until things started to fall apart for them, the Aryan Nations, in 1998. A bunch of Aryan Nations security guards uh, were out patrolling while drunk one night. They ended up beating up and shooting at a Native American mom and her son who'd had the misfortune to pass by while the drunk Nazi guards were out patrolling the perimeter of that Aryan nation's land. Ultimately, a lawsuit was brought on behalf of the woman and her son by the Southern Poverty Law Center. And in that legal strategy, uh, they basically came up with a way to bankrupt the Nazis into losing that land up in northern Idaho. The Nazis were forced to vacate, and then the town's fire department got both great practice and great satisfaction out of systematically burning down all the Nazis' buildings one by one after they'd been evicted via bankruptcy. The United States of America, the modern United States of America, has a stubborn problem with neo-Nazism and overt, violent white supremacy. It's, it always seems amazing every time it surfaces, but we have always had it. And over time, they go through various ridiculous and self-important names and iterations and patterns of symbolic behavior, right? But, but over time, it's all the same basic idea. And at its core, it's always violent, right? It's, it's the order, it's the clan, it's the Aryan nations, it's the Christian identity movement. Now they want to be called the alt-right. Okay, whatever. Their ideas are not new. Their violence is not new. As a country, we have weathered extreme incidents of their violence, even just in the modern era. The Oklahoma City bombing in 1995 killed 168 people, including dozens of kids, brought down a federal building. Today, a 23-year-old extremist from Oklahoma has been arraigned for trying to blow up a bank in Oklahoma City to try and follow in Timothy McVeigh's footsteps. In 2012, a neo-Nazi covered in swastika tattoos who played in a bunch of white power bands, he stormed into a Sikh temple in Oak Creek, Wisconsin. He shot and killed six people in the temple, shot and wounded four others. In 2015, okay. he shot and killed nine people, shot and wounded three others at a landmark African-American church in Charleston, South Carolina. He said his motive for that shooting is that he was hoping to start a race war. They're all hoping to start a race war. They're always trying to do that. This is a, this is a persistent infection in white American culture. And it can be quite fatal. And what I've learned over the course of my 44 years is that this infection in modern American white culture doesn't get better over time. And apparently it never goes away. We are having a particularly bad outbreak of it right now, this year. February, Olaf, Kansas, two Indian engineers shot in a bar by a guy who was screaming racial and religious slurs at them. One of the engineers was killed. The other one was wounded, as was a bystander who tried to save them. That was February. As you can see, uh, there's no secret. 
um, and it's no um, question in my mind who are the benefactors of that robbery that just happened on July 11th where they had, I mean, the jury heist. Now, hopefully we'll get to the bottom of it. Hopefully somebody will be arrested and then they'll start singing and we'll find out if they're Trump supporters, MAGA, uh, you know what I'm saying? Uh, Proud Boys and the likes thereof. You know, so this really kind of disturbed me because what I'm saying is we go for small fish, they go for giant fish. Now, anytime you robbing Brinks trucks and getting the money, you funding something. And you on a big level funding something. And all I'm saying is we need to level up we need to stop shooting up our hoods and level up. Again, I'm not an advocator of violence. <clears throat> I'm not an advocator of violence. I do believe that for every action, there's a reaction. And I believe that there are natural, natu natural responses to stimuli. Um, but when you start seeing that you are the target, um, I'm just saying, your plan need to be a little bit stronger than home invasions. That's just my take on it. Tell me what y'all think and leave your comments below. Thank you for listening. Thank you for being there. I appreciate you and I'll see you in the next video.